here I am. <laughs> Good morning. You know, I feel like I'm still on vacation wearing my t-shirt, my flip-flops. <laughs> is, is, is that okay? Can you go on vacation with me? Right. Last week, I was in uh, Grace Bible Church in Phoenix, Arizona, and, and uh, we looked at uh, prayer in our Sunday school hour, and uh, then the sermon was on discipleship. And during the sermon, they brought up uh, three youth groups and their youth leader, and they explained their mission statement for their youth group. It was, uh, come, grow, and go. And so uh, the, the, the church was sitting there, go? Yeah, go. That's what Jesus did as his disciples. He, he called them, he grew them, and then he sent them out. Go and make disciples. So uh, come, grow, and grow. You know, I was, I was also able to get uh, 11 minutes of Wayne's sermon in. And uh, what an ama amazing word, what amazing God we serve, the Almighty. Um, and uh, what I heard was really good. And uh, Wayne has a really good preaching voice, really does. Um, who are we? You know, in, my, in, 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 in Revelation or to God's almighty, look, he, he, he spoke this universe into being. And who are we? I mean, we, we're, uh, do, do we care about the fleas on our dogs, right? You know, who are we that God is mindful of us? Um, and, you know, I, I, we look around and ask, you know, why did God allow mosquitoes on the ark? Right? Why? <laughs> Why, why, why did he allow Noah on the ark instead of the unicorns, right? Why did he? I thought that was cute. Anyways. <laughs> don't ever, don't ever uh, not heed God's voice. Let's turn to Exodus uh, 16, 32. Two weeks ago, we looked at being baptized into Jesus' death and being raised again to new life with Jesus. There is a baptism to undergo. There's a transformation to be like Jesus. The ark, Noah's ark, saved this promise, the promise and the purpose of the God that he had for mankind through the complete baptism of this world, through the flood. As we were on vacation, um, I, I wish I could share you the pictures, but, but uh, we went through Monument Valley, Valley and we saw the huge layers of sediment. You know, massive. You know, evidence for the flood. Then on the way back, we went through petrified forest where, where the trees were petrified and they went through several layers of that sediment from what they, what they say on the sign is thousands and millions of years, but the tree seemed to grow right through the sediment and then, then you know, uh, petrify right in the middle of that. And it was, it's just evidence for the flood. You just, you, you, any, any dumb person like me can see that, that it, it's, it's just evidence. And I was uh, talking out loud inside the the thing is, we were going through the petrified forest. We are going to the visitor center. I says, yeah, it only takes about 10 years for the, for the tree to get petrified. And the guide over there speaks up and says, well, that's if you, if you put it in a, in a laboratory situation. I said, oh, oh, I guess Mount St. Helens was a laboratory situation, right? Because <laughs> then the, Mount St. Helens, I mean, it, yeah, 1980, I was there. Uh, and Kat was there. We both watched it blow up and... Uh, and there's petrified trees already there and also massive amounts of sediment. And you know what? That's just a microcosm compared to the flood. So that's why we have the Great Gan Canyon and all that sediment layers when it says the fountains of the deep blew up. And, and when I think of fountains of the deep, I'm thinking volcanoes, springs, uh, ash, Mount volcanic ash, huge amounts of sediment layer, and then all this rushing around of water everywhere. I mean, that, that, that just makes sense to me. You look at the, you look at the, the evidence there, it's there. Um, and of course, even during Abraham's time, uh, Seth was still alive. And uh, 
and he recalled, I mean, they, there, was, there was basically people living not too long ago that saw it all happen, um, relatively speaking. So anyways, there was another ark other than Noah's ark that the Bible talks about, the ark of testimony. Does anybody know what the ark of the testimony held? We're going to read out of Exodus 16, starting with verse 32. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come so that they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. So May Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it. Then place it before the Lord to keep it for generations to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna in front of the testimony that it might be kept. The Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. Okay, now we're going to turn to Romans 17, please. You know, manna was put in the ark as, as a testimony that God provided. Even, even though those Israelites, uh, they, <laughs> they rejected God's, God's command to go into the promised land, you know, and, and uh, then God says, okay, you're not going to go into the promised land. You're going to go out to wilderness and wander for 40 years, but God still provided for them. He still provided manna. And this was bread from heaven for 40 years. You know, we need to be reminded of God's provision. It isn't because we're good. Who are we that God is mindful of us? Why did God preserve mankind and living creatures through the flood? We're transforming to becoming like God's son. You know, we, we talked a little bit about metamorphosis of the, of the mosquito, you know, because uh, the mosquito, I, I think even if, even if they didn't get on the ark, you know, the, the larva would have been floating around in the flood waters and they would have turned into mosquitoes anyway. So we're doomed anyway, whether mosquitoes were on the ark or not. But uh, the Bible tells us that we're being transformed. It, it, it also says not, not all uh, metamorphoses are good. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing good will. We, we're... We're, we're, we're being metamorphosized as Christians, as believers. Um, as manna was placed in the ark, it reminds us that God provided bread from heaven for the Israelites. It represented the true and living bread that came out of heaven. Manna was placed in the ark of the covenant or the ark of the testimony. There were three things placed in the ark. Manna represented Jesus, what also was placed in the testimony of the ark? Anybody else? Anybody know? Huh? Tablets, yeah. What else? Aaron's staff. Okay, we're going to read about that. In, in, in Numbers 17, starting with verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and get 12 staffs from them, one, of the leader, one from the leader of each of their ancestral tribes. Write the name of each man on his staff. On the staff of Levi, write Aaron's name, for there must be one staff for the head of each ancestral tribe. Place them in the tent of meeting in the front of the testimony where I meet with you. The staff belonging to the man I choose will sprout, and I will rid myself of this constant grumbling against you by the Israelites. So Moses spoke to the Israelites and their leaders and gave them 12 staffs, one for the leader of each of their ancestral tribes. And Aaron's staff was among them. Moses placed the staffs before the Lord in the tent of meeting. The next day, Moses entered the tent of the testimony and saw that Aaron's staff, which represented the house of Levi, had not only sprouted, but had budded, blossomed, and produced almonds. Then Moses brought out all the staffs from the Lord's presence to all the Israelites. They looked at them, and each man took his own staff. The Lord said to Moses, put back Aaron's staff in front of the testimony to be kept as a sign to the rebellious. This will put an end to their grumbling against me so that they will not die. Please, let's turn to Hebrews 9. You know, the Levites were to be priests. And so this staff represented their 
their, as their tribe to be priests. And a priest is an intercessor between the Israelites and God. They were to do all the crazy stuff like, like sacrifices, uh, swinging the, the um, what do you call it, the incense, praying, uh, sprinkling blood, anointing with oil, all this stuff, uh, laying on the hands and, and going before God in the Holy of Holies. This had to be a Levite to do this stuff. Um, I was going to ask what priests do, and if, if you're Jack and Pam, you live around the co county road P, <laughs> raise a few animals, help out with Woodland School, and do a lot of inventory and implement in the implement parts dealer or something like that. I don't know if I got that right. But, 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 uh, but a priest is in, in, in the Israelite time was, uh, was an intercessor. You know, as I process this, Jesus is our high priest. Aaron's budding, blossoming, and olive-bearing staff produced and placed in the ark represented Jesus in all he does as high priest for the saints. And then we already asked, you know, what else was in the ark, and, and there was no unicorns in the ark, but uh, the, the tablets. But we're going to read out of Hebrews 9, starting with uh, verse 1. Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up. In its first room were the lampstand, the, t the table, and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was the room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Okay, let's, let, we're going to keep our place here, but we're going to turn to Romans 7.7. 7. The stone tablets were in this Ark of the Testimony. It was the law. It was God's holy standard. No human could, could ever abide by the law. It was, it was God's holy standard, you know, it was, it was good, his commandments. I mean, if you, if you look at all the commandments, there's, there's nothing bad about them. I mean, and supposedly they're doable, right? But supposedly our weak human condition, we fail. Um, no one has ever completed all the Ten Commandments but Jesus Christ. You know, it's a, it's a good standard. Man just couldn't fulfill them. Uh, Paul goes over the purpose of this law, these commandments, in, in Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what, the cov what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin... Seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me. And through the commandment, put me to death. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. I, I posted another verse up there on the screen, at Galatians 3.24. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified through faith. The, the, the law could never justify us because we could never keep it. It was, it was something that, that was placed before us, and, 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 and not that we could do it, but so that we could come to the one that could do it, the one that could live his righteous, perfect, holy life and follow all the commandments and, and everything, all the law and the prophets, Jesus said he came to fulfill. Um, Jesus 
Jesus was tempted in every way we are, yet was without sin. Let, let's turn it back to Hebrews 9, 4. Jesus is the bread that came down from heaven. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. All these representatives were placed as articles in the ark. In Hebrews 9, going back and reading back at verse 4, uh, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant, the ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people, for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way to the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Okay, keep your places here again. And we're going to turn to John 20, 11. The three things that were in the Ark of the Covenant, the manna, the budding staff, and the Ten Commandments. You know, sometimes the Ark of the Covenant is called the Ark of Testament. The Ark was a testimony of man's irreconcilable situation of God's standard and his sins covered with atonement. The Hebrew word for the pitch sealing Noah's ark is, is, is the same as, as the covering for this ark. It's, uh, the, the, the Hebrew word is kafar. Um, it's a primitive root to cover, specifically with bitumen, uh, figuratively to expiate or condone or placate or cancel, appease, make atonement, Cleanse, disannul, forgive, be merciful, pacify, pardon, to pitch, purge, put off, to reconcile or reconciliation. You know, that's, that's the Hebrew word for, for the covering on the ark of the covenant. We call it the mercy seat or the, the atonement cover. Or the pitch around the ark was called bitumen which is the same word, kafar, that sealed the ark, that, that saved those. Now, I, I looked up ark. There's another third ark, and this one was the one that Moses was put in when they put him in the Nile. And, I, and, they, and they put, they put um, uh, something around that one, too, uh, like a pitch. And uh, that one is a different word. It basically means like a tarry substance that seals and, and slimes that to keep it from um, whatever you call it. It wasn't the same one, bitumen. So I thought maybe we could get three of them, but uh, it's not related to kafar. The ark was covered with the mercy seat or the Hebrew root kafar. The ark of, was a testimony of God's provision. It was a testimony of God's standard and also his provision of the connection through the Levitical, Levitical line of priests. This testament was, was a small box overlaid with gold and placed behind the curtain in the Holy of Holies. It was unapproachable, really. Throughout Israel's history, the ark seemed to bring victories. But then again, when things weren't right with Israel or, or if the ark wasn't handled right, man, it could be a disaster. Um, back in the, in the time of uh, Samuel, and uh, when Sa Samuel was still growing up and Eli was tutoring him, and Eli had two sons, and uh, they were kind of evil and wicked. They brought the ark to, uh, to the battle scene, 
and uh, the Philistines were, were going to attack them, and, and they took the ark. And the Philistines took that ark, and they, they put it, man, we got the ark, Israel's ark, you know, the one that, that the Israel, the, the God that can split the oceans in half and provide manna and all that stuff. We got it now. And so they put it in their favorite, favorite temple, Dagon. And uh, when, when they put it in Dagon, the first night, Dagon falls flat on his face before the ark, right? They're gone. Falls flat on the face. And they picked Dagon up, you know. He couldn't stand up on his own. So the next day, they come in, and Dagon is again prostrate before the ark, but now his arms are gone. He got no arms. I go, uh oh. So, so they put Dagon back up, you know, because he couldn't stand up on his own. Uh, you know, sometimes gods need our help, and uh, at least then. And then the next night, the third night, Dagon fell prostrate on the floor, and now he didn't have a head. So, not only that, they started getting tumors. Uh, they, they got ills, rats were infesting the place and all that stuff. And so they said, we got to get rid of this thing. So they, 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 they sent it away with uh, two, uh, two, two heifers or two moms, two cows that just said wean their calves. The calves were bawling and the moms took off and said, we're getting out of here. And they went, they, they went all the way to Israel and ended up in Israel. And, uh, and then... When David was on the scene and they wanted to bring the ark to Jerusalem, um, they put it on that ox cart and, and uh, Uzzah touches the ark and <laughs> gets annihilated by it. So, so, so this is the ark. This is the ark of the, uh, of the testimony, just some of the things. You know, God didn't want his symbol of mercy to be used like a good luck charm. This was where God met man. On the top of the ark, in between the two cherubs, was called the mercy seat, or the atonement cover. This atonement cover was a representation of the fulfillment of all, as we see Jesus resurrected. And so now we're going to our text in John 20, starting with verse 11. But Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was a gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. You know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, 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 just reading this, man. It just gives me chills. You know, as I'm seeing the, this whole mercy seat being fulfilled. You know, as the two angels are on the side and, and the, the strips of linen where Jesus was and Mary coming in, and it's a place where, it's a place where Jesus meets us. The place of atonement. The atonement cover. The mercy seat. Verse 17, Jesus says, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm returning to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that, she had, that he had said these things to her. Okay, we're going to go back to Hebrews 9, 11. You know, it was uh, originally, you know, back when Adam and Eve were in the garden, it was the woman who brought the fruit to Adam the fruit from the tree that brought life, brought death. Now, it's the woman that brings the fruit from the tree that brings life to the disciples. It was a seed of the woman that crushed the head of the serpent. You know, there, 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 there's so much to go over, you know. This is the mercy seat. This is the place where, where, where we can meet Jesus. 
And, and it, isn't, it isn't our rituals. It isn't our, our following of, uh, of the law perfectly. It isn't, it isn't uh, all the things we do to, to, to cleanse us, you know, the outward stuff. It's what Jesus does on the inside for us. It's his mercy and his grace and, and, and his atonement for our sins. This is the means to our transformation through this baptism with Jesus unto his death and raised to life to him, a new life. Jesus has done everything for us to change us from damnable creatures to be transformed to the image of, cre of our creator through the covering of his atonement. You know, oh, the wonder of it all. You know, I, I like taking atonement apart and saying at one meant. At one meant. Jesus in his priest, high priestly prayer continued to ask God, may they be one with us as we are one. This is how God has transformed us from being these, these, these fleas, these mosquitoes, this, 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 this creepy things that only thinks for ourselves and sucks out <laughs> the life out of everything around us just so that we can survive and changes us into life givers just like Jesus is. It's a miracle. You know, may we visit this mercy seat that Jesus has permanently made for our connection with God and his holiness. In Hebrews 9, verse 11 when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through a greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and ashes of the heifer sprinkled on, the howl, on those who who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who, is, who made it, because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and the branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face the judgment, so Christ was sacrificed, sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. We'll go to the next chapter, chapter 10, starting with verse 1. It says, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. 
For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. First he said, Sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law required them to be made. Then he said, Here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, we have been made holy. Think about it. We've been made holy. By that will, we've been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you, and Lord, we just, we're in awe. Lord, we, we look at who you are, righteous, good, holy, almighty, and the creator of this universe, the creator of all things. And Lord, you became one of us. You submitted yourselves to, to be a human like us, perfect in every way, following the law perfectly. It was all your plan. Lord, as we look at what you did, Lord, raise us up. Raise us up from, from the, this, this, this humanity that, uh, that is so squandering, that is so selfish, that is so, so self-seeking to be like you because you've paid the price. You've, you've paid the price for, for our sin so that, that we won't continue in this sin, but that, will we, we, that we will be transformed, that we'll be metamorphosized, that, 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 that we will one day be like you, like you originally created mankind to be, your image, Lord, with a heart, that loves purely. Lord, is this that we hope for? Now, hope that, that hope is not hope if we already have it, but Lord, we hope for this, we long for this, and, and we see this through the eyes of faith that one day we will be like you and be known and fully known. Lord, we ask for this hope and Lord, while we are still here, Lord, may we continually to come to you, to meet with you at your mercy seat where you come to us and call us by name. Mary. Call us by name. And may we call you Adonai, our Lord and Savior. Lord, we ask this in, in Jesus' name.